there's nothing better. He's the only one who can. There's nothing better. He's the only one who can. There was a woman uh, a few years ago who uh, was in an apartment building that caught a fire. And the fire department responded, and she was on the fourth floor. And they were able to put this safety apparatus that would allow those who were trapped because the fire was on the floors below her. And she jumped onto that safety apparatus. She was safe. It caught her and broke her fall. Sometime later, she was asked, how did you muster the courage and the nerve to jump? And her response was, it was the only choice I had. Nothing else made sense. It was stay up there or jump. Jesus and this thing that we've come together, uh, the reason that we've come together to worship begins to make sense to us when we recognize that there really is no better alternative. That how we respond to Jesus is really what matters. Hey, they didn't even pay me to tell you that. That was just in response to that worship that I was hearing you guys engaged in. Um, You know, my name is Calvin. I am uh, on staff here at Westside. Thank you to those of you that are here for the first time, those of you that are joining us online. Uh, The elders and the church leadership came together and they made a decision. They said, every now and then we need a break from Craig. And we need, (laughs) and we need someone who is younger, better looking, and funnier. And that task fell on me. Yeah. 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 We, won't, we won't tell him about that, that portion, but it, it really is good for me to be here with you. Uh, we've been traveling through the book of Acts, and uh, we've been uh, learning about the early church, and we've asked this simple question, why not here? As we look at this book, and we see ha- how it documents the history of those early Christ followers, and we see how they responded to persecution. We see Luke, the writer, how he left this record of how uh, the Christianity, how this message of hope from Jesus was to be shared with the hope of converting those who had yet to come to believe in Jesus. So we've been following along in the book of Acts. We're in chapter 4 now, and we, I could spend an hour and a half sort of recapping what we've covered this far, but uh, but I'd probably be here by myself. Um, so I won't cover everything that we've covered thus far in the book of Acts. But last week, Pastor Craig, he challenged us that whatever we do, whether in word or deed, to do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. And so a lot has taken place in the first three chapters of Acts. Jesus, just before he ascends back to heaven, he's been killed. He's been raised from the dead. And then he uh, instructs his disciples that they should not leave Jerusalem, that they should remain there and wait for the Holy Spirit. And just as Jesus promised, he filled them with his spirit. And as a result of them being engulfed and filled with the spirit of God, that it was a miracle took place and they began to speak in the native tongue of all those that were present. They could speak and hear and understand each other. Uh, That day of Pentecost was so miraculous that Peter responded to that feeling of the Spirit, and he was led by that Spirit to preach a message to those that were in earshot. And the Bible says that over 3,000 people responded in faith that day. And And so this new church, this new group of believers went about to be the witnesses of Jesus. And in the second chapter of Acts, it says that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowshipping with one another, to breaking bread with one another. They devoted themselves to prayer. It said that they enjoyed eating together in each other's homes. And and they enjoyed uh, giving of themselves to make sure that all of them had their needs met. And this is what God did in response to that 
union that they had created there, that, that spirit of togetherness, the Bible says that God added to their numbers daily. And the church began to grow, and the word of God spread. And so, uh, not long thereafter, that miracle of Pentecost and Peter's message of hope, shortly thereafter, there was a, a, an, an event that's recorded in Acts 3 that we covered several weeks ago, where Peter and John were on their way to the temple, and there was a beggar sitting there who had been placed there by others, and he saw Peter and John coming, but this was a guy who was easily avoidable. You've met those type of people where you, you, you make sure you don't make eye contact with them. And, but Peter and John saw him, and they responded to him begging, and they said, we don't have any money, but what we do have, we'll give you. And Peter said that in the, he, he declared in the name of Jesus, stand and walk. This delivered man was so excited and ecstatic about his deliverance. See, he had been lame for 40 years. The crowd saw that he was delivered, and a commotion was started. And they came around this man who's jumping and praising God. And Peter saw that as an opportunity to, to be an evangelist. And he shared with them the message of Jesus. Talked about how he had been prophesied about from long ago, and that now he's come. He's been here. He's been killed, but God's raised him from the dead. Another couple thousand people respond to that message, and they become Christ followers. And so now this, this new church, is, it's, it's popping. It's on and popping, as the kids say. It's growing. And so now this narrative uh, continues where uh, in chapter 3, the, because they healed this man, Jesus healed this man through Peter and John, now because this huge commotion has come up, they arrest Peter and John. The religious leaders, the, the political leaders, the, the church leaders of that day uh, did not want this message of Jesus to spread, so they arrest, arrested Peter and John. In fact, this same, these same religious leaders, just weeks before, had condemned Jesus to death. And so they have Peter and John arrested, and they are sitting there. The next morning, they are presented before this court, if you will, the Sanhedrin Council, and they ask them a very simple question. Who do you think you are? Under whose authority, Peter and John, are you healing this man? Under whose authority are you teaching this stuff about the resurrection of the dead? And Peter and John, they responded, and we saw how they responded last week, and we're going to refresh a couple of those verses. If you would, turn to the book of Acts, chapter 4. We're going to look at a couple of the verses that Pastor Craig shared on last week. And the first one is verse 8. After they were confronted by this council of leaders uh, with this question of who do you think you are, Peter, it says here, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them. And just, I want to make sure we don't just gloss over that. The reality is that this Peter, who just weeks earlier was denying Jesus, some of you may remember that Jesus, before his death, in a conversation with Peter, he predicted or prophesied to Peter that he would deny him three times before the rooster crowed. And so Peter did that. In fact, all of the disciples deserted him. He was left alone. But in verse 8, in this response to having been arrested, the Bible says that Peter was filled with the Spirit. Principle take home for us as we uh, respond to challenges in our lives. We are much better off, much more likely to be successful, success being defined as how God would ha have us to respond if we are filled with His Spirit. And so, uh, not only was he filled with, with his spirit, but Peter said this, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, that easily forgettable town, small town, podunk, nowhere, kind of like, kind of like where I'm from. I, I, grew, I grew up in country area, down a dirt road, and it wasn't a dirt driveway, it was literally a road <laughs> way back there. And, and, and it was so isolated that if we heard a car Everybody got up and looked out the window. Yeah, because we knew that they were either lost or looking for us. 
Uh, and so that's kind of like where Jesus is from, because in, earlier in Scripture, in, it said, what good can come from Nazareth? This seemingly insignificant uh, uh, Galilean that it goes on to say, whom you crucified, meaning you killed in a manner that was reserved for the lowest of the low criminals. It's in that Jesus' name, the one that you killed, but God raised from the dead. Meaning that the, you meant it for evil, but God used it to bring about the Savior of the world. It goes on to say in verse 12, uh, and I'm sorry that we'll finish that verse, that this man stands before you healed. It's in his name, in that Jesus' name. In verse 12, uh, Peter says, salvation is found in no one else. Here Peter is making this unique declaration of Jesus' supremacy. He's, he's sort of in line with what Jesus said about himself, where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by who? Me. That's what Jesus said. And so, so this Jesus, this, this, this Jesus that they discarded, meaning the religious, religious leaders, God has, has made him Christ and Lord. This Jesus whom you buried, God has lifted up. He's anointed him. And now every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. And so Peter is saying, for there is no other name on the heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Peter is saying, we're, we're, you've arrested us. We didn't do anything wrong. We simply, Jesus used us to heal this man. And since you've arrested us, um, I'll tell you what I know. And what I know is, is that Jesus is the way to truth. And so we're going to go a little farther in this narrative of the Peter and John having been arrested there before this court, and we're going to continue this narrative on in chapter 4. Uh, but what I would like to do is to develop uh, this idea for you to think about and chew on as you leave, uh, that you and I, we ought to boldly proclaim the good news of Jesus boldly proclaim the good news of Jesus. Now, if you have your Bibles, or if you would like, you can use the, uh, the, your devices to look, use the QR code, and you will have the message notes there that you can follow along. But again, we're going to be in chapter 4. We're going to start at verse 13. Chapter 4, verse 13. Before we go there, I want to uh, recognize that in this point of the narrative, we are dealing with the fact that Peter and John are before these big shots, these religious leaders, these uh, political leaders, these guys who uh, are the church leaders, these guys that call the shots there in Jerusalem. And so this is a, a fearful time for them, fearful time for them. You know, we all deal with fear. It's an emotion that is, it requires a response of some kind. My uh, six-year-old, she has this thing now where she, she loves to uh, hide or, or, or kind of get behind something and jump out and say, boo, to her older sister. And she, now my, her, my 13-year-old pretends that she's annoyed because 13-year-olds are annoyed by everything. Uh, but she responds to her little sister scaring her that, in that way, and my six-year-old just loves it. From time to time, uh, we'll even, if we go on an errand or go somewhere, I'll, when we get home, I'll, I'll jump out of the car, go in real quickly, and I'll, I'll hide. Now, truth is, every now and then, my six-year-old will say, hey, Daddy, do that thing where you go hide and scare us. <laughs> now, I tried to figure out how it works if she told me to do it, but it works anyway. But I go in, I find a hiding place, and I can just hear my, my six-year-old and a 13-year-old running around looking for Daddy, wondering where I am. And mommy pretends like she's not involved, but I hear her too. She's looking too. Uh -huh. But they, they never find me. But then I, I just carefully reveal myself. And sometimes I may say boo and really, really scare them. But it's just real funny. I know that, that's real weird, but, but trust me, as a family, it's cheaper than Disney. That's what, that's what we do. 
Uh, we just kind of we just kind of hang out like that. Mm-hmm. But but the real truth is is that fear, depending upon uh, the level of fear, we all respond to it differently, right? Uh, but in this situation, this was a a type of fear that their lives were on the line. It wasn't the type of fear that you go looking for. You know, it wasn't, uh, you know, a six-year-old or Peter. They said, okay, let's go figure out how we can get arrested today and have our lives hanging in the balance. Wasn't that kind of fear. But they're there. And we want to see from God's Word how they responded. And our hope is that we can develop this idea that we ought to boldly proclaim the good news of Jesus. Let's look at verse 13. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men. They were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then conferred together. What are we going to do with these men, they asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows they have performed a noble sign, and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Boldly proclaim the message of Jesus. And so here we are, Paul and John, they're standing before this court, this council, and they respond to their interrogation boldly. In fact, verse 13 says, when they saw the courage, the boldness, the the ability to uh, handle these troops and to articulate in an understandable way, to have the, the freedom to speak with passion and to speak with authority based on their understanding of these things of God. These religious leaders, they recognize that these men have not been formally trained in these, in these rabbinic ways. These are fishermen. And so when they recognized that these were, these were just unschooled, ordinary men who had, had, they didn't have any uh, political clout, they were not born in the right family, There was no reason for them to be able to articulate the things that they were able to discuss with authority and power before these these educated men. The the only thing that explained that was the fact that they had been with this Jesus, this Jesus whom this court had just recently condemned to death. I have a question. What is it about you? What characteristic about you? What uh, personality or pers- what, what is it about you that when you are around people who do not follow Christ, what are they left with? What's their perception of you as an individual? When a, when a guest, when a visitor uh, attends Westside, what's, what's their perception of, of us as a, as a body, as a, as a living representative of Christ? Are they impressed by our education? Are they impressed by our looks, by the way we dress, by our accomplishments? Or are they left with a realization that nothing can explain the things they've said except this life-changing experience that they've had with Jesus? Why, Why is it that these educated, well-to-do men took note that these Galileans, these fishermen, these no one, these nobodies, why did they take note that they'd been with Jesus? The truth is, if we're going to be impactful, if we're going to make a difference in the lives of those that we come into contact with, it won't be because we sing the right song, it won't be because we dress the right way, it won't be because we watch the right news channel, it won't be because we vote for the right candidate. If we're going to make a difference in the lives of those that we come in contact with, it will be because we've been with Jesus. 
It, it would be easy for me to gloss over that and, and not make that point, but I tell you that because I love you, and I really do want to make much of Jesus and see him turn our community upside down. It's, it's Jesus that they need, not us. It's Jesus. They were astonished at these men, these Galilean fishermen, they were astonished, and they took note that they'd been with Jesus. But look at verse 14. It says, but since they could see the man who was healed standing right there, there was nothing they could say. Why did, why did Luke and the Holy Spirit inspire him to put verse 14 there where it says, but? Because you would think that since they were astonished by what these men had to say, since they recognized that they, that they had been with Jesus, shouldn't that be enough? They knew what to say. They knew how to say it. They, made, they were able to communicate it in a way that it was clear. But verse 14 says, but there was something else that, that, that really drove home the point. And that was the evidence of this healed man standing there before him. There was, they couldn't deny it question then becomes, what is the evidence in my life that I've been with Jesus? What's the evidence? What can people see and know that that's not Calvin? He couldn't have done that. What's the, what's the fruit of our having spent time with Jesus? Maybe it's, uh, you know, you cannot deny acts of love. When we do things that, that are, aren't about us, when they are intricately and only about serving and loving others, you can't deny it. If, if, if I serve at, with one of our ministry partners, let's say uh, a Graceway, or we, or we paint a house of a, of a, of, of a community member, or we, uh, maybe I'm a part of a life group and there's a person who's hurting, they lost a loved one, and my family decides that we're just going to prepare a meal to sort of ease their suffering. You can't deny that act of love. If we, uh, on Easter, and we share the gospel, and people respond by saying, I want to be saved, you can't deny that. They could arrest every one of us, forbid us to speak about Jesus, but you cannot erase those acts of love. You and I, we, may, we could lose our freedom, but those things that we've done uh, to spread this message of hope, those things that have eternal significance, they will live on beyond us. And so I ask that question, what is the evidence that I've been with Jesus? Let's go a little bit farther. Uh, you know, I want to make you aware that uh, there's this idea of fear here that they're responding to. And I've had to respond to fear from time to time in my own life. You know, there, there have been places where I've been, and the truth is, I shouldn't have been there. Uh, let's just say before I was on staff at Westside. Um, I went some places where I shouldn't have gone. And there was this uh, phenomenon culturally where if we're in a group and you see if anything greater than a number of one starts running, everybody ought to start running. So some people respond differently to people running. Like some people, uh, culturally, if they see a guy or a person running, they, ooh, I wonder where he's going. Second by comes by, ooh, ooh, why? Excuse me, sir, pardon me, why are you running? That's how some people respond. But culturally, where, where I'm from, if, if I see more than one pe person running from that direction, I'm not going that direction. It's time to go, right? It's, if they're running, it's time for me to go. It's time to get, get ghosts because fear says there's nothing over there for me and that's good. Uh, and so how we respond to fear impacts uh, how we manage and, and how we uh, respond in those difficult situations. And the hope is from Peter and John's example, we can know that God is with us. I want to share this verse with you. Luke 12, 
1 through 12, the same writer of Acts. We're not going to take the time to read the, all of those verses, but I do want you to write it down and maybe read it on your own time. Luke 12, 1 through 11, and actually verse 12 also. But in this section of Scripture, Jesus has he's been teaching and he's been performing all of these miracles. So much so that the religious leaders, some of these same religious leaders that's here on this council, they have confronted him, and they've been attempting to, to try to jam him up by, based on what he, how he responds to their questions. And Jesus, being God, he, he recognizes that he needs to confront these Pharisees. And so in, verse, in chapter 10 and the beginning of, of chapter 9, he responds to them, and he gives them a series of woes, woe unto you for this, and woe unto you for that. The essence of that is Jesus is trying to drive home to these religious leaders that, that, that it's not about the outward appearance. It's not about the religious uh, examples or the religious performance that they engage in. He was trying to drive home the point that it's really about your hearts. It's about your, your, your inner person. And so Jesus, uh, as they, at the latter part of chapter 10, it says that they, they were attempting and looking for a way to, to trap Jesus. And a large crowd gathered. And, and Jesus says to his disciples that, uh, you know, be on guard for the hypocrisy of these religious leaders. But what Jesus was saying to his disciples, don't, don't fall for that okie doke. It's not about your religious performance. It's not about going through these rituals know that this sovereign God will, re- will reveal all that's done in secret. He sees it all. So you may as well make sure that your heart is right. It goes on where Jesus says, and I'm sensing that they may be responding in fear to these religious leaders. He says to his disciples, don't be afraid. Don't fear man that uh, once you've been killed can't do anything more to you. Don't fear that man. But fear the one who, after you've been killed, has the ability to put you in hell, is what Jesus said to them. Basically, he's simply saying, don't fear limited man, fear God. He says that uh, birds, five birds, can be purchased with two pennies. In fact, indeed, Jesus says, the, the hairs on your very head are numbered. And Jesus, although those birds can be sold for just two pennies, not one of them is forgotten by God. So how much more, since you are worth much more than those birds, does Jesus care for you? So he's got you. Jesus goes on to say, don't be like those hypocritical Pharisees. Those of you that have the courage to acknowledge me before men, Jesus will, I will acknowledge you before the angels in eternity. And then let's look at verse 11, what he says to them in verse 11, sensing and knowing that someday they would be right where Peter and John are. He says to them, when you are brought before synagogues, rulers, and authorities, do not worry about how you will defend yourselves or what you will say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. What's the point? What's the principle It does not matter what challenge or difficult situation you currently face. It doesn't matter if it's a health issue. It doesn't matter if it's a a disobedient child. It doesn't matter if it's a financial problem. It doesn't matter what you are dealing with. When it comes to your uh, commitment to share this gospel message of Jesus, God is with us. He's with us. And so if you don't hear anything else this morning, hear that if I'm going to respond in the midst of persecution, in the midst of challenges, if I'm going to respond by sharing this message of Jesus, I know that God is with me. He's with us. We're not doing it alone. Our our hope is not just built on nothingness. It's built on the fact that the Savior and Sovereign of the world is with us. So we can boldly proclaim the good news of Jesus. Let's look a little farther in our narrative. Uh, Verse 18. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, 
which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. Question arises, what have you seen and heard? What's your testimony? What has God done for you? What, 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 what has God, uh, how has he blessed you? Amen, brother. Here's my story. I'll share my story. God, Jesus, took me from death to life. I was blind, but now I see. I grew up culturally going to church, and, and the church was the right thing to do. But the truth is, Jesus captured my heart. And without him doing that miracle in my life, I would be awaiting an eternity separated from him. But by his grace, by his grace, the Bible says that in that while I was yet sinning, in English, while I was still not doing what God told me to do, Jesus demonstrated his love for me by dying on the cross. That's my story. That's, that's, that's what I've seen. And, and, and he didn't just do that in my life. He's done that in, in lots of your lives. So the question is, when, when we're in a difficult situation, and when we're in a, in a, in a position where, where we're being persecuted, where, it, where, it, where, it, where our natural instinct is to try to protect ourselves, the question is, what is the story that we, re, that we garner our strength from? Is it my boyish good looks? <laughs> is, it, is it my uh, uh, understanding of the culture? Is it my ability to adapt to this culture and that culture? Or is it the fact that I've built my hope on nothing less than Christ and his righteousness? So Peter and John, they're here, and they say, they threaten them. They say, it's okay, buddy. You, you guys can threaten us. And, you know, and sometimes we're going to drop the ball. Peter knows this because Peter recognizes that just weeks earlier, he was denying Jesus. And he wasn't even in a courtroom with, with, with people that could have him killed. He was from a distance following Jesus with just some servant girls. And Jesus, I mean, Peter denied that he even knew Jesus. So much so, he was so emotionally invested in that denial that he began to curse. I don't know that, Jesus. But after being filled with the Holy Spirit, he's able to respond boldly because Peter knows. He's just like that lady who jumped from the building. I don't know anything else that can uh, fix my eternity. And so he shared that message of hope. Let's go a little bit farther. We'll close up on, in verses 21 and 22. After further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. They couldn't deny it. The guy standing there, he's been healed. We've seen him for over 40 years out there at the gate to the temple begging. This Jesus of Nazareth, through these men, has healed this guy. It's undeniable. We would like to keep them in prison or, or even uh, sentence, them, sentence them to death, but they've done this noble thing, and so we can't deny it. And if we were to take action against them, the people, these people, this growing number of thousands of people who've heard this message and responded in truth, they, they would then turn against us. And so they let them go after threatening them. I wish I could end this message there and just say that after that point, everything just went great, that the church just grew, and people were coming to the Lord in large numbers, and Peter and John just lived happily ever after. And from that point on, it was just unicorns and rainbows. That's not true. The truth is, uh, in fact, Jesus had earlier, in a, in, a, in a personal conversation with Peter, he had predicted 
how he would die. Church history says that uh, he was crucified in much the same way as Jesus. By following Jesus, by attending church, by uh, putting our hand to the plow and saying, I'm with you, Jesus, I'm on your team. I, it's just not true that that's going to make everything in your life easy. It's not. In fact, if we choose to follow Jesus in the way that the New Testament describes, it will bring persecution. Listen, I'm not talking about the type of persecution because of uh, the things that we seek persecution for, you know, because I'm right about everything and everybody just needs to believe what I believe. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the type of persecution simply because I profess Jesus. Peter recognized that. And, and then one more verse of scripture that I want to share with you, it's Peter himself, the same disciple who messed up, who stuck his foot in his mouth time and time again, but was filled with the Holy Spirit. And Peter wrote this in 1 Peter 5.10. He said, and the God of all grace, who called you to this, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while. Peter didn't say, if you suffer, or just by the small chance you might suffer. Peter said, after you've suffered, God himself will restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. What's the message, Calvin? The message is that if we share and commit to proclaim this gospel message, it's going to bring about challenges in our lives. But the good news is we have an eternity with Jesus. Jesus has committed to, to, to make us whole. He's committed to, to, to enable us to endure. And so we put our faith, our trust, our hope in him. Peter Cartwright was an old-time evangelist, preacher from the 1800s. Peter Cartwright was a part of what they called the, the, a circuit preacher, where they traveled around the country to different settlements and they shared the gospel, preaching. Peter Cartwright was opposed to, to slavery. And so Peter, who was from Kentucky, he was so opposed to slavery and preaching against it, he had to move for the safety of his family and himself. He had to move to Illinois. And just a history, for you history buffs, Peter Cartwright, right, later ran for Congress, and it was Abraham Lincoln from the state of Illinois who defeated Peter Cartwright. But Peter Cartwright was a, a preacher who had a conviction to say whatever God had called him to say. Just on one Sunday morning, just before he was about to share, uh, preach, some of his leaders came to him and said, hey, Peter, we just want to let you know that President Andrew Jackson is in the audience. And, and we want to let you know so that you don't say anything too political or so that you don't offend him. Peter takes to the podium in a way that Peter is documented in history of doing. And Peter said to the audience, he said, I've come to know that President Andrew Jackson is in the audience, and I've been warned not to uh, offend him and to mark my words. Peter said, but the truth is, if Andrew Jackson doesn't repent, he'll die and go to hell. <laughs> now, I'm not telling you guys to, to speak to folks the way, the way Peter Cartwright did, but Andrew Jackson responded in this way. He said, if I had a regiment of men with the courage of Peter Cartwright, we could whip the world. The, the idea here, guys, is that we put our trust in the sovereign Lord, and he will enable us to boldly proclaim the good news of Jesus. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much. You've been good to us. God, the truth is you've been better than we've been to ourselves. And God, your word is simple. And it's true. You said if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, we will be saved. And so, God, I pray that you would bless us, the hearers, the listeners of your word today, that we would come to know you daily. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.